Well, this is an exciting time. We get to uh, link up with our West Seattle family right now. So would you stand all over the building today? And uh, right now, we're welcoming right now. Welcome to West Seattle. Let's give a big shout out to our West Seattle family. So glad you're in church with us today. Just able to share the anointing and share this uh, incredible presence of what the Lord is doing. And both here in Issaquah and in West Seattle, I want to encourage all of us to even just keep praying for our other campus in Addis, Ethiopia. And uh, God is doing some beautiful things there through Pastor Doug and Tasha Myers and their team. And so we're really excited about here, West Seattle, all the way halfway around the world in Addis. And who knows exactly where God's going to take us next. We're on a mission. How many know that? From the I-90 corridor to the very ends of the earth, that we would be used by God to do great, mighty things. So this morning, let's pray together. Amen? Let's call on God. You've come. You're in the right place. You're in the right house. So let's open up our hearts today. And let's just really believe that the Lord is going to speak something that's going to not only equip us and anoint us, but it's going to change us. So let's pray together here and in West Seattle. Lord, we just thank you for this great moment of being together. We thank you, Lord God, that even though we're just 22 minutes away, we can share this in, in just absolute unity today. And I pray, Lord, that you would speak a living word into our hearts and our lives, that, Lord, we would walk in a spirit of grace and a spirit of love one for another. And I pray, Lord, that you would indeed just equip your people to be able to go into this generation, live boldly, live strong, live with mercies, live with grace, and live with freedom. So, Lord, speak to us today and touch the hearts. I pray, Lord, that this morning that there would be people who would make the greatest decision that any of us could ever make, and that is to choose faith and to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that today would be a day of breakthroughs and a day of miracles in people's lives because of putting faith in the Lord. And we just ask this, God, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Give somebody a little fist bump today. Say hello. Say get ready because the Lord has got a big word that he wants to speak into our lives today. Amen. So glad that you are all here. And uh, I, as you know, I'm not in the business of announcements, but I am in the business of vision. And so today I want to talk to you about vision, what's, what's ahead uh, for our church family. Many of you are new. There's something that we do every week, or excuse me, every year. We call it our Inspire Week. And it's coming up just a few weeks away. We're almost there. It's going to be in March. Hard to believe that March is almost here, isn't it? But it's the end of January. We're just a few weeks away from Inspire. And this is a, a week that we set aside. And God has used this week on the calendar to be one of the most significant and impactful weeks of our entire year. Every single year, He has propelled individuals and propelled us as a church because of this gathering time. So if you got your phones, you got your, your, you know, however you make your notes, I want you to get a few dates on your calendar so that it's separated and, and you can really, you know, make that decision. In fact, as we get out of church today, I'd love for you to be able to even go out in our atrium and sign up today. So let me give you a few dates. One of them is March 13th. That's a Wednesday night. And we have Pastor Rob Ketterling coming to preach to us. And you're going to love Rob. He is a great visionary. He will inspire you. I believe the Holy Spirit will use him and the anointing that's on him to put a deposit inside of you that will help you dream bigger dreams and do even greater things for God. So I want you to come and even expect that God's going to do an impartation into our lives. We're not just spectators, but we're coming to receive from God. West Seattle family, this is for you. It's for all of us on that Wednesday night, March 13th. And uh, so please come. We want everybody to be here. We want to fill the house. And I want you to know just your being in the house is important. You're going to be in a place where God can do something beautiful in your life and it matters. The next day is March 14th. Easy for me to remember because it's my wedding anniversary. And um, so we're, on that wedding anniversary, we're going to have our Inspire Conference. How about that? And uh, so we'll have Rob Ketterling with us. This year is going to be kind of an extra fun thing because we have invited a couple of pastors who used to be on our team here to come back and speak as part of our conference. One of them is Pastor Andy Rosas. He was here with us as our executive pastor for 13 years. So Andy will be with us and he'll preach one of the sessions. And then Tyler Soley, who was our youth pastor for uh, 12 years on our team, 
just last month was elected to be the new lead pastor of our largest church in the region, which is Life Center in Tacoma. So Tyler is the new pastor of Life Center. And uh, so that's a pretty amazing thing coming out of our church into a place of great leadership. They called me, they said, do you think Tyler is able to lead this big of a church? Does he have that kind of experience? I said, look, at Eastridge, Tyler was in 120 board meetings, 120. He went through a building process. He's had a front row seat to leadership. Nobody could be better prepared than Tyler as he's gonna do an amazing job. That's what we're in the business of doing, teaching, equipping, training, sending that the world might be changed for the glory of God. So it's gonna be exciting to have Tyler back with us, to have Andy back with us, Rob Ketterling will be there. And uh, this is what we do that's unique. There's a lot of ministry conferences, but our conference is a little bit different because we wanna raise up business leaders. We believe business is ministry. We don't believe that it's just pastors, evangelists. Are you with me on this? We believe you and your vocation, you are ministering in those spheres of influence. And so we have a whole half a day that will be led by pastors and ministry leaders. The second half of the day is led by our business leaders. And uh, I've asked one of our guys who's a Navy SEAL to come and talk about teamwork Uh, through the lens of a Navy SEAL. How about that? Where are you going to get that? And uh, we've got Microsoft people, Boeing, all these different professionals, men and women, even some government officials we're going to have come in and talk about letting your light shine in all these areas. So you got to be here March 14th. It's going to be amazing, okay? And then that weekend, we're going to have a vision banquet on Saturday night. Now, you need a ticket for Saturday night just so our team can know who to prepare for, okay? But I want you to come. Uh, Many of you are going to know this Nick's name, uh, Pastor Denny Duran. He's coming from Shreveport, Louisiana, amazing guy, uh, football player earlier in his life, a a high-level collegiate, NFL, that kind of thing, but way beyond that, pastoring one of the great churches in America and a great visionary and uh, got that Southern you know, you're just going to love Denny Duran. You can't help but love Denny Duran. So he'll be with us for the weekend for the vision banquet. And then that next Sunday, we're just going to believe God to propel our church forward as we come and we just, we believe God, we sow, and we just believe that we're, we're planting the seed of the next great thing that God is going to do. How many are with me on this? You ready for this? And, and so to see great things... To do great things, you got to be a part. How many know that? Otherwise, it just passes you by. So I want to encourage you, both here and in West Seattle, dive in with us. You know, even today, go out, sign up for the banquet and get your name in there. And let's start praying. Let's start believing. And let's believe God to do amazing things. So it's right around the corner. And, uh, you know, it's also something these nights and days, come and join us. Now, students, I want to tell you something about the Inspire Conference, okay? This is one of those times where you need to go and even just talk to your professors or your teachers and just tell them you're coming to this event <laughs> and, um, and even get their permission to come because I believe you'll get, you'll get uh, released to do that. Business leaders, I want to tell you something else. You should go talk to your leads because if they see, you take them the information on this conference and when they see who's speaking at this conference, it's as good a leadership conference as you will find anywhere in the country. And you, even your, your business leaders don't have to spend thousands of dollars to send you someplace to a conference because we're going to be talking about character, integrity, truthfulness, vision, how to treat people right. How many know that's what life all centers on? And then we got one big thing on top of that, and that's the power of God that comes and makes it all even better. You want to be an MVP? Don't miss. The, no better place to be equipped than in the house of God. Is that true? No better place. Man, I just feel like we should pray again. What do you think? We're going to get in the word. Let's pray one more time. You ready? Lord, I pray for you to speak to us now. You, you want to plant vision in us, and I pray you'll do it in a great way. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, today we're in our series on bold, and we're just going to you know, unpack this week to week. And our, our hope and our vision, I believe God's will for you, is that we're going to grow deeper and stronger and bolder as the people of God. And therefore, we're going to accomplish things that we otherwise would never be able to accomplish if it wasn't for the Spirit of God working in our lives. So today, I want to talk to you about bold, living beyond fear. I would say that as a leader, as a pastor, someone that interacts with people on a daily basis, that the greatest hindrance to you living fulfilled and living uh, really at at the level that God wants you to live is the spirit of fear. 
I think that the devil's greatest tool is the spirit of fear. And right alongside of a spirit of fear is the spirit of shame. And those two go together. And the devil would love to just keep you debilitated. He'd love to keep you on the sidelines. I want to tell you what the devil doesn't want. He doesn't want you knowing what it is to have your sins forgiven, your heart washed, your spirit filled, and your eyes wide open to the big things God wants to do in your life. The devil wants to, to just derail you and, and have you do small thinking, small action, and, and just live in a fraction of what God would really do in your life. And so today I'm here to preach to you and here in West Seattle, I'm here to preach to you life. I'm here to preach to you deliverance and freedom and what it is to have the joy of the Lord, the confidence of God instead of a spirit of fear. But as we begin here today, I want to talk about something that happened this last week. And in my mind and heart, so grievous that we could not just go on with our Sunday morning services as if nothing was happening. Many of you are aware what happened this week in New York, where Governor Cuomo signed a bill to protect and even expand abortion in the state of New York, bringing it up where there's no point where anybody could have any consequences to the taking of a life of a baby, even up until the day of birth. Now, there's some language there that would talk about whether viability or talk about quality of life. I just have to say something to us today. The quality of life is in the hands of God, not you and me. And are are you with me today? I'm going to talk about a big subject here today. And a lot of people, a lot of churches won't even address this. But, you know, I'm here today because I would not be a good leader or a good pastor to you if I'm not willing to talk to you about the biggest, deepest things that our country and our people are facing. And so today I'm here to, I'm here to deliver that. But I want, you to, I want you to know something else. I'm not here to talk to you just because I have a place of, of, uh, of, of authority or I have a place of a title. You know, you could take the title pastor, you could take the authority of pastor off of me. I'm here to speak to you because I'm a born again believer. I've given my life to Christ. I've been exposed to the power of the word of God. And I'm here because there's just certain places, certain times when there's something that's just required of us to not just pass off and act like I see no evil. I hear no evil. There's nothing on, nothing going on. I'm here today and I want you to hear me really clearly. Okay. I want you to hear the big picture. I don't want you to close off with a sound. Soundbite. I want you to hear what I believe the Holy Spirit would say to us. When we talk about this issue, it's a very difficult issue because it deals with the value of human life, but it doesn't just deal with that. It deals with, with people being put in places that most often they don't even want to be put into. My experience in talking with people through a long period of time is that people don't want to go down this road but it's, it's impressed upon, especially the women, with this crushing weight that comes upon them because the nature of a woman is to bear a child and to be a nurturer. And so with this kind of weight, this kind of pressure that comes from different places, it is something that, it, that is just devastating to a woman's heart. And so I want you to hear what I'm saying today. I'm not giving you some callous soundbite. I'm giving you today the grace and the mercy of what the scripture would teach. And I want, I want you to see today the kind of people that we need to be. We, you know, today we need to understand that there's all kinds of sin and there's nobody that could stand here today. Myself, if it was any of our team members, Pastor Larry, Pastor Dan, Pastor John, I mean, you name, I could bring in Tommy Barnett and I could bring in Denny Duran. I could bring in all these great leaders to preach to you. And there's not one person that could stand in any pulpit of the world and preach as someone who has never sinned. Yeah. Because the Bible says we have all sinned and we have all fallen short of the glory of God. It comes in different places, different ways, different situations. But the truth is, every single one of us have made mistakes. Every one of us have sinned. We've fallen short of the glory of God. And there's a pain, there's an anguish that comes along with that. But what I want you to see is that in New York, what they were doing, and I I really couldn't even hardly believe my eyes when I was watching the governor smiling from ear to ear as if he was doing some great achievement by signing his name to a bill that would ensure that in the days ahead that there would be more abortions and more babies that would lose their lives because of the choice that he had. 
And I thought to myself, you know what? I, I do not want that on my resume when I stand before God, because the Bible says we will all stand before God and we will give an account for our actions and what we stood for and what we did. And you know, I'm just saying this to you because we're in a culture today where we live in a spirit of fear. And the fear is to even just tell the truth and to face things because we're worried about how we're going to be perceived and what people are going to say about us and what it's going to cost us and what things are we going to lose if we're a truth teller. I want to just say something to you. You lose far more by not being a truth teller than you will ever lose. Am I here? All by, how about West Seattle? Is there somebody that is with me today. Here we are in the United States. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Well, that, you know, we're not New York. It doesn't matter to us. Listen, this is our nation. This is our generation. This is our watch. And we have some big decisions to make. Who are we going to be? What are we going to believe? And what are we going to stand for? If we can't stand up when things get this bad, when people say, you don't even have to be a doctor, you could just be a practitioner and you can choose to take life. You know, when I, when I stop and I, and, I, and I think about this, the first thing that comes to my mind is the day that I became a dad. And the day that the doctors handed Josh to me, I just couldn't even believe they were handing him to me. And all of a sudden I'm a dad. And I'm like, wow, I don't know if I know everything about being a dad. I'm just worried about even dropping him, you know? <laughs> so the next time they had him all wrapped up like a football and he could lay in the palm of my hand, it was a lot easier just to palm him, if you know what I mean. <laughs> and then there was the birth of our sweet, precious Janelle. That was just an amazing thing. And then our, our youngest, Jordan, and Jordan, as you, many of you know, was born in crisis. And they told us, we don't believe that your son is going to make it. And they took Cheryl and I and pulled us off into a private room. And they told that, you know, they were going to take him to another hospital where the kids in the greatest need were medevaced out to. They were going to take our son there. And they were going to take me and they, you know, Cheryl just given birth and Cheryl says, I'm going with you. I'm not staying here. So they put both of us in a little room to think about what was happening. And what we thought about was our little Janelle and what she said to us one day. She said, you know, God doesn't, doesn't uh, mind, doesn't care about what you want to name the baby. You can name him anything you want, but God does want Caleb to be part of his name. He needs to be Caleb. So here we are. We, we just kind of shrug little Janelle off. She's just a little tiny girl, right? We're just like, oh, that's cute, Janelle. Thank you. Bless you. You know, <laughs> get out of here, you know? And, uh, but when we were in that room being told that our baby's life hung between life and death, we thought about a word spoken through a child, that his name shall be Caleb. You know what Caleb means? It means a good report. And the moment that we talked to each other about Caleb, it, our hearts stirred and inside of us, we just believed that God was gonna bring our son through. He was on the platform today. God brought him through. But I don't just think about those. I think about my little grandsons. I think about... Trenton, who's six years old, and I think about Drew, who just turned three. And I mean, they stunned me. I can't believe it. I mean, how can a three-year-old talk to you about everything under the sun? How can a six-year-old have a better golf swing than I do? I mean, I don't understand it. I mean, I don't understand it. But it's the preciousness of the gift of life. And I, and I, I want to be so careful. I want you to hear me today. Because it's not only the children that are healthy and, and you know, because in our culture today, we say, well, you know, as long as the baby's completely healthy, you know, I want to say something. God, God works through all kinds of different things. And God is the one that brings the preciousness and the value of life. And here's what I'm trying to say is that I understand the scenarios. I understand women who are being crushed, usually by the influences of men who say, well, you know, this isn't going to happen or that's not going to happen. Or if you do that, I'm, I'm leaving you. And they're left under these unbelievable pressure packed situations. And the enemy just comes with the attack of his shame, guilt, fear. Am I, am I telling the truth today? And, and these result in just places of deep brokenness. And then on top of that, here's what happens, is that if you have had one of these experiences, then you feel like you're unqualified to ever address the issue because you had failure in your own life. 
I want to tell you something. You've got to walk in the light that you're in. You have to understand that when you come to Christ and you ask Christ for forgiveness, you are cleansed. You are forgiven. You're not the same person that you were. You don't have that hanging over you. The Bible speaks about that he washes our sin away. He said that if you are faithful to confess your sin, Jesus is talking about Jesus. He is faithful and just, and he will cleanse you and wash you of all unrighteousness. You don't have to stay in this place of hurt and, and fears and anxieties and shame and feel like I'm disqualified to ever speak truth to anybody because I've got this own thing that happened. No, you need to just walk in the grace that you are in and let the Lord teach you how to lovingly touch other people because we're all sinners. We've all failed. We've all got our own stuff. There's nobody that wants all of your stuff to be revealed to everybody else. Nobody can withstand that. We need to be people of grace, mercy, and truth. That's who God made us to be. But you've got to walk in the light that you're in. Can I just give you a very simple illustration of this? I've told this to some of you before. But I believe that you should date and teach your kids to date only people who share your faith. Now, some people go, oh, man, that really narrows the field. And, uh, but, you know... There is something, and I've observed this for a lot of years, there's something so amazing about journeying through life because life has trials, challenges, difficulties. How many of you know what I'm talking about? And to be able to share your faith with the person who's supposed to be most intimate in your life is so important. To be able to walk in a spirit of unity, to walk together. And um, I'm praying with you. Any of you who are married with someone who doesn't share your faith, I'm praying for you because I know that you want to love them and respect them and help them but it does add an additional layer. You know what I'm talking about. Nobody can ever deny it because it's just a reality. There's another layer when you don't share your own faith. And so that's why I say, I think that we should date people. And here's why. Let me just give you a little tip. Are you guys ready for this? Put your thinking hats on. This is deep. Are you ready? We have a tendency to marry people we date. That, that's how that works. Now, for some others of you, you might need to hear this too because it may be a good tip for you that you should date somebody before you marry them just so you know how that works. <laughs> but my, my point is this, is that my mom and dad were unbelievers. Their families they had no, no faith in, in Christ at all in their backgrounds. And my mom and dad met each other while they were basically being drawn to the Lord. And so they met each other. They, they had a little bit of a dating relationship. And my mom came to the Lord and she ended up leading my dad to the Lord. And my mom and dad are just such people of integrity. They just want to be so careful that what they do has integrity. That I think they made a mistake in how they read things. Because they would never tell myself or my sisters, you should date people who share your faith. Because they knew that... That wasn't how they came together. So how could they tell us something that wasn't true in how they operated? Does that make sense? Here's what I'm saying to you. It's not a lack of integrity to say I've stepped into faith. Now that I've stepped into faith, I see things differently than I did. Come on, somebody, when I was over here. You know, you don't make your decisions over here based on this knowledge. You make your decisions over here based on this knowledge. And I have my eyes open, my spirit open, God's feeding me and strengthening me. And now I hand over everything God's now doing in my life. I hand it to you. Does that make sense? And I want you to experience. I don't want you experiencing me, the old me. I want you to experience what God is doing in me now. Have I lost you or are you still with me today? So e even as, as we're talking about these things, I want you to know today that if you have made mistakes and, and you have places of regret, I, you are not cast off by God. That is not what the gospel teaches. The gospel teaches that if we ask forgiveness, the Lord forgives, he heals, he changes us. But here's what else I want you to see. In a gracious, loving way, you need to stand up for what is true. You need to be bold. I need to be bold. Our generation needs for us to be bold. 
I've been hearing some good news about our younger generation. I'm, I'm hearing that, that there's a stirring where they're tired of, of really all the stuff that's being handed over to them. And they're like saying, you know what? We just want to have real life. Tell us the truth. Just tell us the truth. Let's get down to what the truth is. You know, Romans chapter one, if you have your Bibles, are you with me today? Romans chapter one. In fact, let me, let me take you to Psalm 127 first. And if I'm preaching truth, you could give me a little support somewhere along the way here or in West Seattle. Psalm 127 says these simple words, unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain. In other words, if you wanna have a, a house that's blessed, you need God to be the center of your house. Don't lie to yourself and think that we don't need God. We don't need to be paying attention to him. We don't need to serve him. We certainly don't need to obey all those things and we're gonna be okay. No, you need to realize that by the measure you use is measured back to you. You need to know you gotta sow in order to reap. You gotta know if you want God's blessing on your house, you've gotta bless God in your house. The next line says, unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stand guard in vain. And then it goes on and it says this, in vain you rise up early and you stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those he loves. Out of this one Psalm, God is dealing with so many issues in our life. If you want your community to be strong, you need biblical principles in your community. You know what we need to start praying for? We need to start praying for government officials who have an experience with God and have a reverence and an awe and will stand on behalf of the things that are true. We have a pretty messed up political system at the moment moment. And the only way we're going to get out of this thing is not even just who gets this and that, but we need God to move in the hearts of leaders. We need to pray for that. In fact, I want to challenge you. Many of my pastor friends around the country are challenging their church to take the next 21 days and just pray for God to stir proper words and the heart in the leadership of our nation. How about you? Would you take on the next 21 days and just pray for God to do something among our leaders that we could see something happen in our country? Unless the Lord builds the house, we're wasting our time. Unless the Lord watches over the city, there's not enough police officers. How many know that? And then it says this, you gotta have the right perspective of how your house is blessed or you're just gonna burn yourself out. You're gonna be up early and toiling late just for food to eat. But you know what the Bible says? God gives sleep to those he loves. God wants you to have a spirit of, of peace even when you're facing difficult things, for you to be able to put your head down and know that God's peace goes with you, even in the midst of the storms. Do you know that's possible? That's only through faith, it's only through prayer, but it's right out of God's word. The next thing the Bible says is, sons are a heritage from the Lord, children are a reward from him. You know, I just wanna to speak to this whole issue today, that, that children are a reward from God. And it's just so tragic and so sad to see a child who is, who is in that process, viable, able to go forth, the dreams, the plan. The Bible, the Lord said to Jeremiah, before you were born, I knew you. Isn't that amazing? Who are we to disrupt the blessing of God? I wanna tell you something. Sometimes you may feel like, you know, hey, I'm, I'm doing the child a favor by not having it because I'm not ready for it. That's a lie from hell. The devil comes to bring fear and he comes to bring shame. You may be under crushing weight and crushing pressure, but I want to tell you something, that doesn't change the value of the innocent life. What about Pastor Larry talking about, what was that game, dino, whatever, you know? Don't miss what today might be pressure filled, but tomorrow be stunning to you of the beauty and the grace of this little child. Shouldn't we support that? You know, the other thing is, as a church, listen, we've gotta just keep praying that we can get better at helping people, supporting people, giving people pathways, that we're helping people make the right decisions, and, and we need to be grace-filled. And I just, I'm gonna say it over and over and over again. There's nobody in this church that can be looking down their nose at anybody else. Every time that we call somebody to the front, it's not a place of shame. It's a place of deliverance, both here and in West Seattle. It just says, you know what? We're all clay. We're all people. We all need the God. We all need the Lord. But I'm just saying to you, we, we've got to stand up and shake ourselves in this generation. Young people, I want to speak to you. Don't, don't go to 
the great universities of our, of our era and, and, um, and, and take in all this. I mean, think about who's in this room. I mean, so many of us here on the east side, you're even working in the tech industry. I mean, because of you, we have Bing. Because of you, we have Google. Because of you, we have the opportunity at a moment's notice to have information fly into our awareness that we could have, no other generation could have even imagined the inflow of information, right? Technology, information. And yet with the midst of it, when we darken our heart toward the Lord, all of our knowledge comes to nothing. Without God, what should be wisdom becomes foolishness. I want you to think about a governor surrounded by people with big smiles on their face, signing the bill that will actually take the life of a beautiful child on its way. And to think that that's some great achievement on their part. In Romans chapter one, it says this in verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel. You know what the gospel is? That means good news. It's talking about Jesus coming to the earth because he loves us. The gospel is the good news that Christ took our sin, our brokenness. My sin, your sin was destroyed at the cross. And on the third day, Jesus was resurrected. And on that third day, he showed the demonstration of the power of God, not only for him to be resurrected from the dead, but the power that can raise you and me from the dead, that we can live different lives. That's the power of the gospel. And it goes on, it says, because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. What does that mean? Every tongue, every tribe, every generation, every ethnicity, the power of the gospel is God's gift to everyone, everyone who will simply believe. Look what it says, first to the Jew, then for the Gentile. For the, in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Isn't that an amazing passage of scripture? Don't you love the scripture? The scripture is just telling us the things that are real, the things that are true, the things you can anchor your life on, unmovable and unshakable. Look what it says next though. Verse 18. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godless and wickedness of men, godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. I mean, isn't this unbelievable? Here we are, a generation with knowledge at our fingertips, and yet we have to willfully suppress what we know is true to put the ink on the paper. We have to willfully make a decision. And this is what blows me away, is you have all these people out here who say that they are too wise and too intellectual and base themselves too much on reason to somehow become foolhardy and go to something called faith or somehow call on a God. I don't need God. I'm able to do this on my own. Those very same people who say, I'm too intellectual, I'm too based on reason, actually are the same people who suppress the truth that confronts them. And they basically lie to themselves of everything that they know is true because you cannot in your right mind do the things that we are accepting and telling ourselves that it doesn't matter because the truth is in your soul, you know it does matter. And in your mind and in your heart, you do know what is right from what is wrong. You know what the Bible says? Because all of creation testifies. Even on a beautiful day, even I guess the foggy, rainy day, the glory of God is witness to us every day. That there's a God who is so far greater than we are and so far beyond we could even imagine. You know what the Bible says? They have to suppress the truth. I gotta ask you, honestly, when you look at your own life, and the decisions and the choices and the attitudes that you're forming, are you a person who is suppressing the truth or are you embracing the truth? What's the reality? The Bible goes on, here's what it says. Men who suppress the truth of their wickedness by their wickedness. Okay, let's stop. We have the ability for doctors to operate on babies with defective hearts while the baby is still inside the womb. Because they know that if they do the surgery while the child is inside the womb, the heart valves will heal without any scar tissue. And yet, these same people 
sign on the dotted line to say you should be able to choose if this person is even worthy of being carried on to life. You have to willfully suppress the truth. You have to tell yourself, I'm not gonna think about it, I'm not gonna talk about it, I'm not gonna talk about reality. Because we know with ultrasound, we know with technologies and everything else, heartbeat, all those things, we know what the truth is. Will we receive it or will we suppress it? You guys are getting super quiet. Verse 19, since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. In other words, when we stand before God one day and we say, man, Lord, I didn't know. I didn't know. I had no idea. I had no idea. What do you think the meter is going to be doing when you stand before God? <laughs> you know, I'm thinking <laughs> there may be a problem there, right? There may be a problem. Listen, is God here to judge? Is God here just to make, to make you feel terrible about things that may have happened? In your life? No. He's trying to move us towards mercy. He's trying to move us towards cleansing. He's trying to move us towards how great is God's love for us that, that he will receive us. He says there's no condemnation for those that are in Christ. If you come and receive Christ, you are made whole. You are clean. You are purified. And you have the blessing of God. I'm just saying you can't allow the devil to suppress you. You've got to be able to stand up and, and just be able to live the truth and, and walk in the truth. Here's what the next thing that the scripture says, and I'm going to move on. But it says this in verse 21. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks. You know, when you, when you stop worshiping and praising and acknowledging God, you get on shaky ground. Because you start, you start going by what secular people do instead of what a spiritual person does. Look with me to the next verse. It says this. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. Can I just say this to you? When we deny life and death, when we think our opinions and our convenience is more important than someone else's life, I mean, it's just unbelievable. And I'm just saying to us, let's not walk in this suppression of truth and in the foolishness of men. Let's walk in the mercies of the Lord. Let's let God's mercy be what it was designed to be. Let it be the washing, the cleansing, the transformation of our lives. You know, I'm here to talk to you about boldness. And, and, and I know I'm almost out of time, but I'm here to talk to you even about a promised land. In the Old Testament, the promised land represented what God wanted to do to take the nation of Egypt. They'd been slaves in Egypt for 430 years. And they were crying out to God because they were just so oppressed. And because God heard their prayers, he raised up a man named Moses. And we know him today as the great deliverer. But I think we got to rewind the story and remind ourselves what happened in Moses' life. Moses got angry one day because he saw the Egyptian man beating up on a Jewish man. And out of his anger, he went over there and took the situation into his own hands and he struck the Egyptian down and he killed the Egyptian. Even put the sand over him to try and hide it. And then someone came to him and said, I saw you, you're the one that killed that Egyptian. And there was a shock wave that went through Moses' life and he fled, he ran for his life. And he literally ended up on the far side of the desert running for fear of his life. Let me tell you how the devil holds you back. The devil's greatest plans are fear-based and shame-based. And he wants you to run. He wants you to be ostracized. He wants you to feel like you're, you're a failure, like nothing can ever good happen. And he wants you to end up on the dark side of a desert. That's what he really wants for you. He wants you to live in a fraction, in a shell of who God wants you to be. He wants you to live with shame hanging over your head, your mouth closed because you're disqualified, and you just living in the midst of that darkness. Christ did not go to the cross so you could live in a hole filled with shame and darkness. Christ went to the cross to defeat the 
devil that comes to kill, rob, and destroy who you are and the future. Just like you are the child that God wants to develop, you're the child that God wants to bring as an inheritance. And the Lord's going to stand up on your behalf and bring cleansing into your life. But you got to see what happened. Moses is on the backside of the desert because he feels disqualified because he's, he's stuck in a place because he's afraid of being discovered. And what does God do? God sets a bush on fire, a supernatural demonstration. And out of curiosity, let me tell you something. Some of you today are about to have your life changed. In fact, it's happening right now because the Holy Spirit is speaking truth to you today. And some of you just happened to kind of halfway meander into this place and you had no idea what God was going to do today. For some of you, you came with a friend. Some of you were driving by. You just felt like, hey, I should check that out. And you got here today. And out of curiosity or whatever else, there's a burning bush. And out of the midst of that, God is speaking to you. He called Moses by name. And he told Moses, take off your shoes because this is holy ground. Some of you today, you're experiencing something in your life where God is saying, my word is holy. My work is holy. You need to acknowledge this. And in the midst of that, he spoke and he said to Moses, I want you to go and I want you to be the deliverer. I want you to go and speak to Pharaoh. Moses is like, Lord, I think you got the wrong guy. I'm out out here on the backside of the desert because I messed up. I'm out here because I'm afraid. I ran for my life. I, I struck a guy when I shouldn't have struck him. I killed a man I shouldn't have killed. And you you got the wrong guy. But the Lord doesn't say, because of your failure of the past, I can't use you in the future. God says, you're my chosen vessel. And, And Moses goes, who shall I say? You know, how can I go? I'm a man of stammering lips. And the Lord is saying, I'm gonna go with you. And he gave one of the greatest revelations anywhere in the scripture. He told Moses, I am that I am. What does that mean? I am the eternal God. No beginning, no ending. I'm the God that sends you. Now go in the power of God. And when Moses went to the Pharaoh, the Pharaoh hardened his heart. And the Lord had to pour out plagues upon the land to finally where it just broke the back of the, of the Pharaoh. And he said to Moses and the people, the Pharaoh said, leave, just get out of here. You need to go. And it's amazing, isn't it? that after 430 years of slavery, wouldn't you think they would just be running for the border just to get out of there? But when the people of God are leaving, you know what the Egyptians did? With nobody even telling them what to do, the Egyptians came out to the door frames of their homes and they started handing the Israelites their gold, their silver, and their possessions because they just knew God was blessing these people. And isn't that amazing how God works? And they got out in the wilderness and they came up and the Pharaoh changed his mind. You know this story. Some, you know, say, oh, it's just, a, it's just a fictitious. No, it's the real deal. They got out in the midst of the wilderness. And in the midst of that, the Pharaoh changed his mind, sent his army chasing after them. And the Lord said to Moses, just lift up your staff. And out of faith and out of obedience, the guy that was disqualified on the backside of the desert because he killed somebody, raised the staff of the Lord and God parted the Red Sea and the people of God went through on dry ground. So don't tell me God can't do something with your life. Don't tell me that you are so failed that you can never fulfill God's destiny and God's purpose. Don't tell me you're disqualified from bearing the fruit of the kingdom because that is a lie from hell and that's just shame-based fear that has no place to touch your life. They got out, they got out into, the, into the wilderness And the Lord's talking about becoming a nation. He's talking about taking them to the promise of the land that he had already told their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I'm going to give this land to your your descendants. It's going to be your inheritance in a divine way. And they get out there and Moses says to the leaders, he said, I want every one of you tribes, all of the ancestral tribes, there were 12 tribes of Israel. I want all of your tribes to be represented. So you select some men out of one man of every one of your tribes, and I want these guys to go in and scout out the promised land. So here's here's what we find in Numbers chapter 13, if you have your Bibles, have your devices. In Numbers chapter 13, verse 17 says this, when Moses sent them to explore Canaan, he said to them, go through the Negev to the hill country, see what the land is like and whether the people who live there are strong or weak many or few, what kind of land they live in, is it good or is it bad? What kind of towns do they live in? Are they walled or fortified? How is the soil? Is it fertile or poor? And are the trees 
Are there trees on it or not? Do your best to bring back some of the fruit of the lamb. You got to love Moses. I mean, Moses was a great leader. He wanted to know the whole thing. He wanted to know, go in the land, tell me what the soil's like. I mean, would you have chosen, tell me about the soil. Is the soil good? Is it fertile? Tell me about the people. Are there a lot of them or a few of them? Do they live in cities? Are there fortified areas? Do they have walls around their city? What, what's it like? I mean, Moses wanted to know the whole story. This is kind of how I see myself. I've told you this before. I view myself as a positive uh, a realist. What does that mean? I don't want you blowing me smoke. If you're on my team, I don't want you telling me everything is going good when you know the wheels are falling off. I want to know what's really happening. But then I want to approach it with faith instead of fear. I want to know what's happening, and then I want to be positive about it, and I want God to give us the right decisions and plow us forward for the glory of God. You know, when we built this building, I'll tell you what, it took years, and, and there was all kinds of ups and downs. Uh, you know that. Any of you who've been in this part, you know what I'm talking about. It's up, it's down. And in my nature, I would get up and I would tell you everything that I know. I would say, hey, here's, here's what's happening this week. And I would tell you what I'm told. Two days later, I would have a meeting with an architect or a city official, and they would tell me something totally different than I heard two weeks ago. And then I'm like, oh my gosh, would you like to go stand in front of the church and rewind the tape for everybody? But you know what I learned through that whole process is that, and I, I was doing our staff chapel a couple weeks ago, and I told this to all of our leaders. I said, if you're going to do something great for God, if we're going to do something great for God, we have to stop being so easily discouraged. Because there's nothing that God is going to do of significance and strength that is going to come into your life uncontested. Everything that really makes a difference, there's a devil, there's an enemy of your soul who's going to fight against breakthrough, forgiveness, cleansing, joy, freedom, witness. Come on, somebody, you know what I'm talking about. And even right now, we're, we're, we're in the process of looking for phase two, and we're trying to sell a building. And you know, there's ups and there's downs, and one day it looks this way, and the other day it looks this way. And you know what I've learned through this process is, you know what, we don't give up because somebody's got a negative report, nor do we get totally excited because somebody says, oh, hey, all of this is going our way. No, we are who we are doing what we do because we've been called. And we don't go up or down based on the reports of men. We move forward by faith because God has called us to walk by faith and not just by sight. When they were out there in that promised land, they, they said, it's just exactly what God said. It's a land that flows with milk and honey. Moses said, try to even bring back some of it so we could see it. And that was a tall task because the blessing of God was so amazing on that land. The Bible says that they took one little cluster of grapes and that cluster of grapes was so huge that they had to get a pole and two men put the pole over their shoulders to carry. Man, have, have you seen that at Trader Joe's? You know, guys just going out with grapes, you know, that huge that two guys have to haul it to the car. But that's what it was like. And get this, the people said, it was exactly like the Lord said it was going to be. It flows with milk. It flows with honey. So listen, if you were these people and, and you had prayed and asked for deliverance and you saw God take you out of Egypt and people were handing you their valuables while you were walking out and then you saw the Red Sea part and you're coming through and the Lord's leading you with a pillar of fire and, and a cloud, don't you think you could take on when the guys are hauling back grapes at two guys? Don't you think your faith would be big enough that you would just go take what God has said? This is your future. This is my plan for you. This is my blessing. Don't you think you could just possess the blessing? but they didn't have that. 10 out of 12 people came back and they said, yep, it's everything God said, but there's giants in the land and they are huge. You ever been around a spirit of fear? Yeah. How fear grows? Yeah. Is it true or not? Yeah. Yeah. And you get 10 guys talking about, we, oh, we can't do that. Did you see those guys? Remember, how, you know, these guys might've been seven feet tall, but by the time they talk it through, they're like 12 feet tall. You know what I mean? And and th this is just how fear goes. And they're looking at each other and they're like, we can't do this, it's impossible because they're, they're giants. And we look like grasshoppers to them. In fact, we look like grasshoppers to ourselves. Fear will keep you from the promise that God has for you. Yeah. Understand promised land. Back in the Old Testament, promised land represented an actual physical place that was promised to be their point of blessing. In, the, in this era where we live today, 
The promised land is, as the Lord said, broad is the road that leads to destruction, but narrow is the road that leads to life, and few will find it. The promised land today means you don't have to suppress the truth in your life. You don't have to lie about who you are. You don't have to lie about truth in your situation. The promised land is literally a spirit of revival. It is living a different life because of God's blessing in your life, and you can have a different life. The whole world can go one direction, but you you can be different because you get yourself in relationship with God. There's a blessing that can overtake your life. Am I preach, preaching truth to you today? Yeah. Is it getting through? Yeah. Is it getting through? So Moses stands before the people and there's only two guys who have anything good to say. One's named Joshua. The other one's Caleb, right? The good report. Caleb says, Let's go take the land because God's given it to us. We can do this. Just confident, strength. You know what? He saw the same giants, but the Bible says he had a different spirit. I got to ask you, do you have a different spirit or do you just have the spirit of the world? Do you have the spirit of shame, the spirit of fear, or do you have this Holy Spirit that comes to lift the burdens, to shift your thinking, to transform you, to give you confidence? It's not based on how good we are. Nobody has the right to preach this amazing message of Jesus and forgiveness. It is the grace of the Lord that works in every one of our lives equally. Wow. You know what Joshua said? We should take, you know, when I'm telling you about how they were talking, they weren't just like, hey, we should go take the land. No, they were so grieved by the fear of their buddies that they fell on their faces and they were crying out to God. You read it, Numbers chapter 14. And then they got up and Joshua said, we should go do this. Why? Because God has removed their cover and he is with us. They have no chance. Wow. When was the last time you reminded yourself if my heart's right with God, then God has forgiven me, cleansed me. His Holy Spirit is trying to just get control of me. If God is for me, who can be against me? You know, there's a lot of self-talk. Do you know that? And a little bit of self-talk needs to be like this. I am who I am by the grace of God. I'm no longer the way that I used to be. I'm not going to walk in arrogance. I'm not going to look down my nose at anybody else. But Lord, I want to just reflect your glory. I want to be a truth teller. I want to be honest. I, I want the glory of God. I want to be, be grace filled. I want to be loving. And I want to be a person that you can use. Lord God, just melt my heart. Melt my heart, Lord God. And don't let me be arrogant. And don't let me miss the will of God. But Lord, let my heart be yours. Today, I want to talk to you for a moment. I'm going to ask here in West Seattle, would you just bow your heads with me for a moment? I know the Holy Spirit is speaking so strongly right now. And I know that there are many people right now in West Seattle, God's just touching your heart. And today, what he's saying to you is don't miss it. Don't miss what it is to be loved. Don't miss what it is to be forgiven. Don't miss the great future that God has for you. And so today, as you just take a moment and, and consider that, if you're not right with God, but you want to be, I want you just to lift a hand in West Seattle right now and just claim it. Just say, God, you know my heart. You know my life. I'm, I'm unashamed of the gospel. I'm not going to suppress the truth. I'm just going to yield to the truth. And Jesus, I just ask you to come into my life and to forgive me. Lord, I just know I need you. I want to be right with you. May not understand everything there is to know about you, but I know this much. You've touched me today and it demands my heart. And so, Lord, forgive me step into my life, help me today. Lord, I just pray over our West Seattle family right now, decisions being made in the heart right in this moment. And I pray, Lord, for the courage and the boldness today to just take you at your word. And I pray for you to just bless these, bless the people that are responding right now. And I pray, Lord, that even as they come forward, as Pastor Craig comes to lead this, this close, Lord God, just give them courage, give them strength. And we pray this together in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.